Alrighty. Well, I just want to thank everyone for allowing me the opportunity to come and uh, to speak uh, with you today. Uh, it's such an exciting, you know, event. Um, but I only have 10 minutes. That's going to be my biggest challenge. So hold on to your seat and let me take you through a whirlwind glimpse into my world. So the first thing is, I didn't know at all that I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. I didn't even know what neurosurgery was. In actual fact, I'd started down the pathway and I was going to actually be a pediatric surgeon. I was actually on the general surgical training program. But life gives you unexpected opportunities. And the neurosurgical trainee at the time had a skiing accident and hurt his knee. And they picked me up out of my comfortable zone and they put me into neurosurgery. I didn't know what they were going to do to me. I thought all I had visions of were patients, you know, sitting in a coma, and I was frightened. I was terrified. I was unbelievably surprised how much I enjoyed it, how different it was to my perception. I had to come off the general surgical training program, but sometimes if you find something that you believe in or that you, that you like, you have to be prepared to take a leap of faith. So people have been interested in neurosurgery for thousands of years. We find these skulls that some of them are over 6,000 years old with evidence, and I better help show you, that's a trephine. So that's where they have to take an instrument and they have to open the skull to, to let something out, whether that's blood or infection. Now they didn't know about that 6,000 years ago and it was often done for, for what they thought were evil spirits. But every continent on the earth has evidence of this primitive form of surgery, over 50% of them showed signs of healing, so they survived. This other person, person's skull, is Phineas Gage, and he had a lot, he worked at a train uh, railway line, and a big uh, metal pillar went through his cheek and out through the top of his brain. That was back in the 1850s. He survived incredibly. He never lost consciousness, and it was pulled out. But it changed his whole entire personality, and he was uh, studied till the end of his days. And that sort of began the fascination with neuroscience and, and where different parts of the brain do what. This other picture is from a 1962 movie called The Brain That Never Dies, and it's about head transplant. And uh, we might talk more about that at the uh, end of the talk. So I have been fortunate enough, and, and, and it's why did I enjoy neurosurgery? Because it's in its infancy. We know a lot, but we know so little. And even in my time, we went from doing nothing with hydrocephalus, which is water on the brain, to having CT scans, which we used to have to put air into the water spaces of the brain to be able to see them, to now we do MRI scans of babies within the uterus, and we can actually see the brain structure. And yes, keyhole surgery exists for brain surgery. The scope is four millimeters. My working channel is one millimeter in order to do that. So incredibly, I learn things as a, as a trainee that I don't do today, and I have to continue learning to keep up with the new advances. It has never lost the fascination for me. And I try to keep my pictures to a minimum. I know some people aren't used to it, but I hope you can see some of the beauty that's in my eyes. This is normal brain. This is a tumor. This is a brain from major trauma. But you learn a respect, and I see the beauty of the working brain and its various arteries and veins and knowing that some parts are so eloquent you can't even put any pressure on it. And that's what keeps me going day in and day out, trying to discover, to learn, and to help the people that come to me. But I enjoy my work because I can go in and I, and I can still say to this day, gee, I've never seen that before. So to me, and the way that I learn and I approach life, I like that sort of challenge. So why do we do it? Every, uh, every medical specialty has cancer, and it is a privilege to be able to walk the journey with those people. But for malignant cancers, we can only control it for so long, and we know they're not going to be with us perhaps for long, a long time. But there are many conditions which are benign, and if we can use our skills in microsurgery and we can take that lesion out, then not only is it can they live a long life, but they can live a good life. So this tumour in a 20-year-old, a benign lesion despite its massive size, and if left there, it'll cause paralysis, blindness, changes in hormones, and eventual death. An operation like that with a microscope takes anywhere to 10 to 12 hours of operating. 
but we did remove it. He had no deficit except the vision loss that he came into us with, and he will live a long time. It's a benign lesion. This is a tumour. This is the spinal cord and the nerve roots coming down. That person presented with pain and presented with loss of motor of one leg. Able to remove it, she's pain-free and walking and, you know, will live a long life. So very different to my very imp early impression of neurosurgery. There are many, many conditions that we can help people with. The bottom picture is of a, of a child with a cyst at the back of the head. And again, being able to remove it, repair it, and, and the child will have a long life. But it gets even better. We live in a land of high technology. And I meant to say that that's our cat, Gizmo, and that I, I appreciate technology. He does have an Instagram site, Gizmo the Cat 123. <laughs> <laughs> so in uh, neurosurgery, we have, we have a GPS system. So we have a camera that, that allows us to, to identify uh, electrodes placed um, on, the, uh, on the patient. And then we have, we're able to track the fibres using the MRI scan that I showed you. You can see there's a cold spot here, and that allows me to find the safe corridor in order to remove the tumour for the patient. That operation I couldn't have done 15 years ago. That just shows you the camera system. That's my registrar operating. There's the camera, and obviously we're, when you put the pointer onto the patient's nose, I can see it on the computer screen. Now we have an intraoperative MRI, right? That's what I do to my anaesthetist if he's not behaving himself. <laughs> and we can actually then take the patient while we're operating. We, the scanner is next to the operating room. We can put them into the, operating, uh, into the scanner. And therefore, I actually have in real time, what's happening? What can I do? Can I take more tumour out? Because every time we operate, the brain shifts. This has increased the safety and the quality of the operations we can do. So technology is paramount, and honestly, you, we are living in an unbelievable time. You know, you buy a phone and six months later there's something else. But it, become, it does become expensive for everyone. We're operating on conditions that previously we couldn't. We're operating on much older people, much sicker people. It's all, you know, but our, and our understanding of healing and disease processes and what we can do is exponentially increasing as well. But so is the cost. And Newton's third law states every action has an opposite and equal reaction. And we do have to think about the resources and how we can do the best for the most amount of people. So I have a lot of sayings, and uh, one of them is not can we, because you know what, I'm a big believer in that positive thinking, we, can, we always can. But the question we have to answer is should we? Now that's a decision I sometimes have to face every day, but as a society we need to think of that as well. If we go down a path of treatment which is futile, it may put the patient through pain and suffering for not a lot of gain. And we have an, I have another saying that you know, there are some things worse than death. And to save a patient to be admitted to a nursing home disabled is not a win. So these are the discussions that I have to face and society has to face. And lastly, again another saying, altruism can hide many sins. Neuroscience and the research that's occurring is phenomenal. It is exciting, but at times it's terrifying. And sometimes our knowledge and our technology far exceeds our ability to answer the ethical questions. So I mentioned the brain transplants, and certainly if anyone's been watching the news lately, there's a Chinese uh, scientist doctor who is transplanting the heads of mice between different mice, and he says it works. They only live for a few minutes after, when they wake them up after the operation. There's an Italian uh, neurosurgeon uh, who wants to, he thinks he's gonna ask for a volunteer to do this in the next few years. The question is, should we? Now they say what they learned from this, that they will help people with paralysis and they can, they're justifying what they're doing. I don't have the answer for you, but society does need to, to ask these questions and does the end justifies the means? Head transplants, of course, goes to our, the core of our identity and, and who we are. So I think that's gonna be a challenge that we'll face certainly in the next few years. I just want to finish that I thought the last two speakers were, were so incredibly uh, positive role models for all of you girls. I hope that I am as well, but I want to tell you that do not be afraid to follow your dream. There are people around you who will say you can't do it. Just smile at them politely and then do what you believe in. Whatever you do, and it doesn't matter what it is, be passionate. 
be interested in it. Talk to the people around you, and it doesn't matter whether they're the typist who helps you, you know, to the politician who you're having dinner with. Everyone has a story, and incredibly, all the stories are very, very interesting. But please, do work hard, but remember that life is about balance. No one ever gets to the end of their career and wishes they'd done one more craniotomy. So make sure that you work hard, but play hard. Surround yourself by your significant others and enjoy the life that, that you have. Thank you.